So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And to, uh, we were a bit anxious how many people will turn up after these years uh, when we got used to not seeing each other, not going to places, and um, uh, not being yeah in crowds. Well, we, we don't have a danger of that. We, we are. It's not a crowd. But thank you so much for being uh, for coming. So. Uh, this is the second program uh, during the English Majors Week, and uh, the title is Ulysses 100, Performing the Words and Music uh, of Joyce's Ulysses. It is widely, widely known that Ulysses is a great novel, a seminal novel, a masterpiece, um, which has a lot to do with the fact that 1922 has become the Annus Mirabilis in literary uh, history. We are here today, however, not to command the greatness of Ulysses, uh, but to enjoy its words. The music of its words and the music uh, incorporated in its world. Uh, this is this way marking the 100th anniversary of its publication in book form. Um, our event also fits into the theme of the week, uh, Living in Denial. As Ulysses parades all sorts of modes of living in denial and related psychological phenomena. Desperate attempts to uphold precious illusions, um, escaping into fantasy and or nostalgia from the misery, anxiety and pain of the present day, uh, or the present moment, uh, as some of the scenes will testify. But of course Ulysses is also a powerful commentary on its own time on all kinds of socio-political and cultural discourses, challenging all kinds of stereotypes and prejudices. No wonder it was often deemed dangerous in, a ver in various ways, in various circles, uh, before, on and after its uh, publication. As George commented in a letter written uh, to a prospective Italian translator in September 1921, quote, no English printer wanted to print a word of it. In America, the review, the little review, where it was serially published, was suppressed four times. Now, as I hear, a great movement is being prepared against the publication on behalf of Puritans, English imperialists, Irish republicans, and Catholics. What an alliance. What an alliance. Gosh, I deserve the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> By now, Ulysses has ceased to be dangerous, but it has retained its power to affect, to shape one's perception, and to offer something new every time one goes back to it. So enjoy this performance, performance whether your ears are Joyce virgins or not. Stately, long, of Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lava on which a mirror and a lead razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown on girdle was sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called up coarsely. Come up, Kench! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the round congress. He faced about and blessed greatly thrice the tower. the surrounding country, and the waking mountains. And then, catching sight of Stephen Dedalus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, black wine in its length, and that the light, untonsured hair grew grain and hued like pale oak. But William peeped an instant under the mirror and then covered the bowl smartly. Yeah. Back to bear. He added in a preacher's tone. For this, O oh dearly beloved, 
is the genuine Christine. Body and soul and blood and ounce. So music please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. Uh, a little trouble about those white corpuscles. Silence all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, slow whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there the gold points. Chrysostomus. Two strong shield vessels answered through the calm. Thanks, old chap. That will do nicely. Teach up the car, will ya? He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose uh, folds of his gown. The plump, shadowed face and sullen, open jowl recalled a prelate, patron of arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. <laughs> The mockery of it. Your absurd name! An ancient Greek! He pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over to the parapet, laughing to himself. Stephen Dudley stepped up, followed him wearily uh, halfway, and sat down on the edge of the congress. Watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, did the brushing of bow and lather cheek and mouth. Mulligan's gate voice then called. My name's Axel too. Malachi Mulligan. Two doctors. <laughs> but it has a Hellenic ring, isn't it? Tripping and sunny like the Bok himself. Uh, we must go to Athens. <sighs> uh, will you come? If I can get down to fork up when you quit. He laid the brush aside and locked him until I'm crying. <laughs> Where did he come? The Jejun Jesuit. Seizing, he began to shave it clear. Tell me, Mulligan. Yes, my love. How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? But Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. God isn't it dreadful. A ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. God, these bloody English, bursting with money and indigestion. Because he comes from Oxford, and always arriving late. You know, Daedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Change the knife blade. He shaved wearily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther. Where is his gun case? <laughs> a woeful lunatic. Were you in a funk? I was. Out here in the dark, with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself while shooting a black panther. You saved men from drowning. I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on here, I'm off. The polygon frowned at the lava on his razor blade. He got down from his perch and began to search his trouser pocket hastily. Land us alone with your nose rack to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty, crumpled handkerchief. Monaghan wiped the razor blade neatly, and then, gazing over the handkerchief, he said, <laughs> The Bard's nose rag. A new art of color for our Irish poets. Smoked green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted at the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair, opaque hair stirring slightly. 
God. Isn't the sea what I just call it? A great sweet mother. The snot green sea. The scrotum tightening sea. Epi. Oi, no papunto. Ah, Daedalus! I must teach you! You must read them in the original! Tonata! Tonata! Tis a great sweet mother! Come and look! So she said, 
She could see from where she was. The eyes that were fastened upon her set her pulses tingling. She looked at him a moment, meeting his glance, and the light broke in upon her. White hot passion was in that face, passion silent as the grave, and it had made her his. At last they were left alone without the others to pry and pass remarks, and she knew he could be trusted to the death, steadfast, sterling man, a man of inflexible honor to his fingertips. His hands and face were working, and a tremor went over her. She leaned back far to look where the fireworks were, and she caught her knee in her hands so as not to fall back, looking up. And there was no one to see, only him and her, when she revealed all her graceful, beautifully shaped legs, like that. Supply, soft and delicately rounded. And she seemed to hear the panting of his heart, his heart's breathing. Be because she, she knew too about the passion of men like that, <laughs> hot blooded. Be because Bertha Supper told her once in that secret and made her swear she'd never. About the gentleman lodger that was staying out of the congested district board. Dad had pictures cut out of papers of those curtains as an high kickers. And she said, he used to do something not very nice, th that you could imagine, sometimes in the bed. But, 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 this, but this was altogether different from a thing like that. But because, because, because there was all the difference, because he could almost feel him draw her face to his and the first quick hot touch of his hands on the lips. Beside that was absolution so long as you didn't do the other thing before being married, and there ought to be women priests that would understand with us your telling out. And Kissy Coffrey? And Kissy Coffrey too sometimes had that dreamy kind of dreamy look in her eyes so that she too. Oh my dear. And Willie Rippingham, so mad about actors' photographs. And besides, it was on account of that other thing coming on the way it did. And Jackie Carefree shouted to Luke, There was another! And she leaned back, and the gutters were blue to match on account of the transparent, and they all saw it, and they all shouted to Luke, Luke, there it was! <coughs> And she leaned back ever so far to see the fireworks, and something queer was flying through the air, a soft thing to and fro, dark. And she saw a long Roman candle going up over the trees, up, up, and in the tense hush they were all breathless with excitement as it went higher and higher, and she had to lean back more and more to look up after it, High, high, almost out of sight, and her face was suffused with a divine and entrancing blush from straining back. And he could see her other things too. Nancy knickers, the fabric that caresses the skin, better than those other petals, the green, for and eleven, on account of being white. <laughs> and she left him. And she saw that he saw. And then it went so high, it went out of sight a moment. And she was trembling in every limb from being bent so far back that he had a full view high up above her knee. And no one ever, not even on the swing or waiting. And she wasn't ashamed. And he wasn't either to look in that immodest way like that. Because he couldn't resist the sight of the wondrous revealment half offered, like the skirt dancers behaving so immodest before gentlemen looking. <laughs> and he kept on looking. Looking. <clears throat> she would fain have cried to him chokingly, 
held out her snowy slender arms to him to come to, to feel his lips laid on her white brow. The cry of a young girl's love, a little strangled cry wrung from her. That cry that has rung through the ages. And then, a rocket sprang and bang, shot blind, blank, and oh, then the Roman candle burst, and it is like a, it is like a sight of all, oh, and everyone cried, oh, what? Oh, it rocked us, and it gushed out of it. Oh, a stream of real gold and sweat. And they said, no. They were all green, dewy stars, falling with golden. <laughs> so lovely, soft, sweet, soft.
What visible luminous sign attracted Bloom's, who attracted Stevens' gaze? In the second story Rear of his Bloom's house, the light of a paraffin oil lamp with oblique shape projected on a screen of roller blind supplied by Frank O'Hara, window blind, curtain pole, and revolving shutter manufacturer, 16 Onlier Street. How did he elucidate the mystery of an invisible, attractive person, his wife Marion Molly. Bloom, denoted by a visible, splendid sign, a lamp? With indirect and direct verbal allusions or affirmations. With subdued affection and admiration. With description. With impediment. With suggestion. Both then were silent. Silent. Each contemplating the other in both mirrors of the reciprocal flesh of their his not his fellow faces. Were they indefinitely inactive? At Stephen's suggestion, at Bloom's instigation, both first Stephen, then Bloom, in penumbra urinated, their sides contiguous, their organs of micturition reciprocally rendered invisible by manual circumposition, <laughs> their gazes, First Bloom's, then Stevens, elevated to the projected luminous and semi-luminous shadow. Similarly, the trajectories of their first sequent, then simultaneous urinations were dissimilar. <coughs> Bloom's longer, less irrelevant, in the incomplete form of the bifurcated penultimate alphabetical letter, who, in his ultimate year at high school, 1880, had been capable of attaining the point of greatest altitude against the whole concurrent strength of the institution, 210 scholars. Stevens higher, more sibilant, who in the ultimate hours of the previous day had augmented by diuretic consumption and insistent vesicle pressure. What different problems presented themselves to each concerning the invisible, audible, collateral organ of the other? To Bloom, the problems of irritability, tumor sense, rigidity, reactivity, dimension, sanitariness, pilosity. To Stephen, the problem of the sacerdotal integrity of Jesus circumcised January the 1st, holiday of obligation to hear Mass and abstain from unnecessary survive work, and the problem as to whether the divine prepuce, uh, the carnal bridal ring of the Holy Roman Catholic Apostolic Church, conserved in Calcutta, were deserving of simple high degree, or of the fourth degree of Latria, according to the abscission of such divine excrescences as hair and the toenails. What celestial sign was by both simultaneously observed? A star precipitated with great apparent velocity across the firmament from Vega in the Lyre, above the zenith, beyond the star group of the Tress of Baroness, towards the zodiacal sign of Leo. How did the centripetal remainder afford egress to the centrifugal departure? by inserting the barrel of an originated male key in the hole of an unstable female lock, obtaining a purchase on the bow of the key and turning its wards from right to left, withdrawing a bolt from its staple, pulling inward spasmodically an obsolescent unhinged door and revealing an aperture for free egress and free ingress. How did they take leave, one of the other, in separation? Standing perpendicular at the same door and on different sides of its base, the lines of their valedictory arms meeting at any point and forming any angle less than the sum of two right angles. What's, what sound accompanied the union of their tangent, the disunion of their respectively centrifugal and centripetal hands. <laughs> the sound of the peal of the hour of the night by the chime of the bells in the church of St. George. What echoes of that sound 
whereby both and each heard. By Stephen. By Bloom. Miliata Rubinatium. Tormas et Pompe. Jubilatum Tabir Kim. Curs et Sipia. Where were the several members of the company which, with Bloom that day, at the bidding of that peel, had travelled from Sandy Mount in the south to Glasnevin in the north? Martin Cunningham. In bed. Jack Power. In bed. Simon Dedalus. In bed. Ned Lambert. In bed. Tom Kernan. In bed. Joe Hines. In bed. John Henry Manton. In bed. Bernard Corrigan. In bed. Betsy Dignam. In bed. Betty Dignam. In the grave. <laughs> Alone. What did Bloom hear? The double reverberation of retreating feet on the heaven-born earth. The double vibration of a Jew's harp in the resonant plane. Alone, what did Bloom feel? The cold of interstellar space, thousands of degrees below freezing point, or the absolute zero Fahrenheit, centigrade, or Rea Muir, the incipient intimations of proximate dawn. Of what did bell chime and hand touch and footstep and lawn chill remind him? Of companions, now in various manners, in different places, defunct. Percy Epchon. Killed in action, Mother River. Philip Gilligan. Thysis, Jervis Street Hospital. <coughs> U.F. Kane. Accidental drowning, Dublin Bay. Philip Moisel. Boemia, Hightsbury Street. Michael Hart. Thysis, Mother Misericordia Hospital. Patrick Dignan. Apoplexy. Sandy Mount. What prospect or what phenomena inclined him to remain? The disparition of three final stars, <coughs> the diffusion of daybreak, the apparition of a new solar disk. Thank mm -hmm. you.
I'd love to have the whole place swimming in the roses. God of heaven, there's nothing like nature. Mm. The wild mountains, then the sea, and the waves rushing, and the beautiful country with the fields of oats, and wheat, and all the flying cattle going about. Mm. That would do your heart good to see rivers, and lakes, and flowers. All sorts of shapes and smells, colors, springing up even from the ditches. Primroses and violets. Make sure it is. As for them, saying there's no God, I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for all that learning. Why don't they go and create something, I often asked him. Atheists or whatever they call themselves, go and wash the cobbles of themselves first. Then they go howling for the priests. And, why, and then they die. And why? Why? Because they are afraid of hell on account of their bad conscience. Ah, yes. I know them well. Who was the first person in the universe before there was anybody that made it all? Who? Uh -huh. That they don't know. Neither do I. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, there you are. They might as well try to stop the sun from rising. Hmm. The sun shines for you, he said. The day we were lying among the rhododendrons on her head. Mm -hmm. In the great tweed suit and his, his straw hat. The day I got him to propose to me. Yes. First, I gave him a bit of seed cake out of my mouth. And it was leap year like now. Sixteen years ago, yes, my God, after that long kiss I near lost my breath, yes, he, he said I was a flower of the mountain, yes, so we are flowers all, a woman's body, yes, that was one true thing he said in his life. And the sun shines for you. Yes. That was why I liked him. Because I saw, felt that he, he, he understood what a woman is. And I knew I could always get around him. And I gave him all the pleasure I could leading him on till he asked me to say yes. And I wouldn't answer first, only looked out over the sea and the sky. <laughs> I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of. Maui, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Stanhope, and Esther, and Father, and old Captain Rose. And the sailors playing, all birds fly, and I say stupid, washing of dishes, they call it on the pier. And the, the sentry in front of the governor's house, with the, with the thing around his white helmet, um, oh, the poor never half roasted. And the Spanish girls laughing in their shawls and their tall combs, and the auctions in the morning. The Greeks and the Jews and the Arabs and the devil knows who else from all the ends of Europe and, and, and Duke Street um, and the, and the fowl market. Yeah. All oh, cocky outside Larby Sharon's and the, and the poor donkey <laughs> sleeping half asleep. 
and the wake fellows in the cloaks asleep in the, in the shade of the steps. And the big wheels of the carts mm, that the bulls pull. And the old castle, thousands of years old, yes. Mm, those handsome moors, all in white, and turbans like, like kings asking you to sit. Oh, and Ronda, hmm. with the old windows of the posadas. To blessing thy Oh, for her lover to kiss the iron. Uh, and the wine shops, half of them. <laughs> and the, the watchman going all serene with his lamp. And oh, that awful deep down torrent. Oh, and the, the sea, the sea crimson sometimes like fire. <coughs> and the glorious sunsets, and the fig trees in the Alameda gardens. Yes. And all the queer little streets, and the pink, and the blue, and the yellow houses, and the rose gardens, and the jessamine, and geraniums, and cactuses, and Gibraltar as a girl, where I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, when I put the rose in my hair, like the Andalusian girls used to. Or, hmm, shall I wear a red? Yeah, yes, and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought, well, as well as another. Mm. And then, I, I asked him with my eyes to ask again. Yes, and then he asked me, would I yes to say yes, my mountain flower? And first, I put my, my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume. Yes, and, and his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said yes, I will. Yes. More. A husky five note blue, blue, blue. Bloom is on the gold pinnacle hair. A jump satin, breast of satin. Rose of Castile. Trilling, trilling. I the Lord Peep. Who is in the peep of gold? He cried. The bronze in pity and the coal pure, long and throbbing. The long and dying coal. Decoy. Soft word. But look, the bright stars fade. Notes chirping answer. Oh, Rose, Castile. The moon is breaking. Jingle, jingle. Jointed, jingling. Coin rang. Clock clacked. A vowel. Sonne, I could. Rebound of garter. Not leave thee. Smack. La cloche. I smack. Of warm. Sweet heart. <laughs> jingle. Goodbye. Blue. Boom crashing chords. When love absorbs. War, war, the tympanum. A sail. A wave, a wave upon the waves. Lost. Fossil fluted. 
all is lost now. Horn, horn. When first he saw. Jonas. Full top. Full throne. Warbling all lure, alluring. Martha, come. <laughs> clap, 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 clap. Good God, he knew her heard in all. Death brought bed, brought bed, knife to up. A moonlit night call for poor. I feel so sad. <laughs> yes, so lonely blooming. Listen. The spite and winding called Seahorn. Have you the? Each and for other flash and silent roar. Pearls when she lists rhapsodies. Hiss! You don't? Did not? No. Believe? Lit lit. With a cock. With a cara. Black. Deep sounding do and do. Wait while you wait. He, he. Wait while you he. But wait. Low in dark middle earth embedded or Namine Damine Richard is he or gone or fallen Tiny the tremulous fern folds of maiden hair Amen He gnashed in fury Fro to fro the baton coo for truly Bronze lit here by mine gold by bronze, by gold, in ocean green of shadow. Bloom, old bloom. One wrapped, one dead, with a cara, with a cock. Pray for him. Pray, good people. His gouty fingers knackering. Big. Bada bam. Big. Bam bam. Last rose, cast the yield of summer left. Bloom. bloom. I feel so sad alone. We. True men, lit her cow, thee and all. I, I, like you men, will lift your... Ching, big, chong. Where bronze? From a near. Where gold? From afar. Where? Hoofs. Begin.